Repentance to Israel. First of all, turn with me over to the fourth chapter of Acts. I want to read a few things that happened to the Christian preachers, the apostles, the disciples, the followers, those who worked with them in the early church, in the fourth chapter of Acts. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. So here is one of the happenings in the early church when the Christian preachers were being persecuted and actually physically taken into the possession of their enemies and put in jail. Now, this happened a number of times. This happens to be a time when they were put in, and then the priests decided that they would like to put these men to death, and then other times they attempted to, but they were unable to because of the intervention, either direct intervention by the Lord God Almighty or fear among the priests themselves of the people. But as we go on in this story, we we'll get over to verse 17. But that is spread no further among the people, and this, of course, are the priests and the elders talking that is spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Let us threaten these people and prevent them from preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. So here is a case where the people or the rulers of these people desired to destroy the preaching of Jesus Christ, and they dared not do so because of the fear of the people. In the fifth chapter of Acts, starting in verse 17, then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth. And then we have the story of the angel. This is direct intervention by God, in this case, for the deliverance. The first case was deliverance because of the fear of the people. And as you read on here, the angel delivered them. And then after they were delivered, when they were brought back again before these men, in verse 28, they asked them, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So here was the thing that they were preaching, repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And this, of course, was the thing that the priests and the elders and the Sadducees desired to stop. A little later on in this same chapter, and I won't read all of this, you know the story about uh, Gamaliel standing up and telling the rest of the priests and elders that this thing is either of God or is it is not. If it's of God, then you can't do anything about it. If it's not of God, it will fall by itself. It will disappear by itself. Now, this priest, Gamaliel, was the one, of course, who taught Paul, and apparently he had the good sense to recognize that if God desired something to be done, it would be done, period, regardless of what they did. They couldn't stop it. He said in verse 39, But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. These men actually realized they had the good favor of God by being made to suffer, for Christ's name. The very fact they were suffering for preaching Jesus Christ was proof in their hearts and minds that God was with them. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. 
Now this has been the thing that has happened to Israel and the church all down through the ages. Persecution and physical persecution in many cases has actually brought out a pure teaching of Jesus Christ. These Israelites, when they're really put to the test and physically beaten or punished or tortured in some manner, they turn to the pure gospel. Perhaps that's been the problem in America. We have had an easy time of it. It has become the common thing, the thing that is right to do, to attend church, and no one persecutes the church, and everyone gets along. And the ministers have decided that, well, if we don't preach too much of this or too much of that, then no one will get angry and no one will turn away. They'll all love us and we'll all get along. And for a hundred years, that is literally what has happened. But here in the early church, God used the opposition by other people to bring about the preaching of his truth of the word. And these men spoke some specific truths in here that we realize that one of the things they did in verse 42, daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Some of these verses are one of the reasons why we have decided, and I talked to people on this trip also, who get our tapes and hear the radio broadcast here, of course, that they believe it's important that we attempt to preach daily on the radio. Now, this uh, means that uh, we'll not be able to go on as many stations as we probably could if we just went on Sunday. But I believe that Israel has come to a place and time where we need literally daily preaching. And in that manner, by having a five-day radio broadcast and then the Sunday services here, we actually get out six times preaching a week for the people. In talking to some of the folks we met on this trip who get our tapes, we find that they listen to those tapes several times a week. It isn't just a case of listening to them once. We talk to people that listen to them as many as three and four times, every one of them. Now, you know that takes quite a few hours. Each tape is two hours long. If they listen to it three hours, that means they've listened to preaching for six hours. And they don't do it all in one day. They do it several times during the week. And here it is, early church, in the persecution, in the trouble, and in the trials, under orders from the religious leaders of the day, not to preach in Jesus Christ, went out and taught daily. And they taught in every house. And we praise the Lord that literally, through radio and tape, we can preach in every house. Every house that desires to hear the word can hear the word of God through radio and tape. It's physically impossible for a handful of ministers to cover this tremendous nation. We're a lot bigger than the city of Jerusalem. Those 12 disciples and a few more over there could go around from house to house and they could reach many people and cover the area in a matter of days or weeks. We can't do that, but God has provided us with the method of doing it here today. By a radio and tape, we can preach in every house in the nation that desires to hear the word of the Lord. These men were preaching to Israel. They were preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were preaching according to verses 29 to 31 in Acts 5, where Peter said, and the other apostles answered. In other words, this was agreement among the apostles. We ought to obey God rather than men. This is a principle established for the entire nation of Israel. We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on the tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince, in other words, a ruler, and a Savior, for to give repentance to Israel, and forgiveness of sins. Repentance to Israel. This may be the hardest thing to preach and get across to the minds of this stiff-necked, hard-headed generation of Israelites. Repentance to Israel. Israel must repent. Not the Negro, not the Chinaman, not the Communist, but Israel must repent. And these men recognized this, and apparently this may have been part of the reason why they ran into so much opposition. You can go out even today, and this is an example. You can go out today and preach personal salvation all across the land. You never run into any problems. You go out and tell them that the nation must repent, and they either ignore you 
won't have anything to do with you, or they call you a false prophet and all sorts of other names. When you talk about national repentance by the race of Israel, and Peter and these men were preaching repentance to Israel. Now I'm going to make a point by using some newspaper articles here for a few minutes. Most of these, I believe, were sent to me by one lady, but they're similar to newspaper articles that are being printed in newspapers all across the nation. You see some of them in the local papers, although this paper is not quite as bad as some of the papers in other cities. But generally speaking, they follow one line, and I'll just hold them up and read a few things from this to show you that you can even verify the scripture in the newspaper. Now, the newspaper didn't intend for you to use it that way, but that's what happens. Here's one from the Church Chronicle. And uh, this is part of the Houston Chronicle, Houston, Texas. This is all the church news. Headline, Judaism Insight Necessary to Understand Jesus Christ. And then the article goes on and shows that Christians must understand Judaism and the Jews in order to understand Jesus Christ. Here's another one. Jews Episcopalians Share Facilities. Another man wrote an article titled, Eliminate Subtle Racism by Changing Our Habits. And they have to learn to love everybody in all races, and especially you Christian people have to do that, you see. Here's another one by a rabbi saying that Israel is not an Arab land, and referring to the idea that the Jews have been in that land for over 2,000 years. Here's another one. Catholic children learn about Jewish festival, and the Catholic church arranged for part of their children from their church to go to a place where they were carrying on a Jewish festival, and then it was all explained to them. Well, the Passover is um, the article in another newspaper, and by the way, in every one of these newspaper articles, as they explain the Passover, they point out that it is the festival which commemorates the Jews coming out of Egypt. The Jews coming out of Egypt. In each case, it says that. It says, uh, referring to the bread, this is what the Jews were compelled to eat when they fled Egypt across the desert because they had no leavening. Here's another one about the Lutherans. Fix us a cedar. Lutherans asked the Jewish women. And so here's the Lutheran church took quite a number of their women, and they went over to a synagogue, and then the Jewish women explained all of these things, and they showed how this was part of the things that they did when they came out of Egypt. Over and over, every newspaper article identifies the Jews as the chosen people and as the children of Israel who came out of Egypt. Here's an article by UPI writer Louis Cassell's Christian Acceptance of Jews Improves. And he writes to say that it's becoming uh, a little easier now for the Christians to accept the Jews, including a quote from such things as this. Paul said that even though God established a new covenant with mankind through Christ, he has not and never will abrogate his ancient covenant with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The history of the past 2,000 years vindicates Paul's view that Judaism is destined to live alongside rather than be swallowed up or replaced by its daughter religion, Christianity. How about that? Christianity is not to be the final universal religion. It's supposed to live alongside of Judaism. Then they go on and explain about the Jews and, and so on and so on. And then they refer to the uh, Vatican Council's historic statement on the Jews says in the present tense that, quote, God holds them most dear. Alongside of that was another newspaper article which was sent to me, and it's not headlined on there, but it is about Christians and America. And one of the things it says, America cannot and this is quoting, apparently, some book. Now, I don't know what book it's quoting because you see the headlines cut off up here. America cannot confidently count her immense wealth as a sign of divine blessing, adds the report. Some of these things are signs of our own greed and foolishness. How can we be sure that America is not another Babylon, material prosperous and spiritually bankrupt? In other words, newspaper articles are now showing that the Jews are Israel, which they've always done, but of course to a greater extent now, and that America may be Babylon. America is Babylon. Zondervan Publishing Company has already published a book which identifies America as Babylon and the nation that will be destroyed according to 
the books of Jeremiah, and so on. We are Babylon. This one is worth reading, the first part of it. Let anti-Semitism die, Christians told. They're quoting a uh, minister. Christians should ignore anti-Semitic passages in the New Testament and let them die. Dr. Roy A. Eckhart, chairman of the Department of Religion at Lehigh University, said here Monday in a blunt talk at the first scholarly Jewish Christian symposium at Baylor University. The symposium ends Tuesday. In a fierce attack on Christian attitudes toward Jews, Eckhart said that since anti-Semitism began with the crucifixion of Christ, quote, we have to let Christianity die. In other words, because Christianity is anti-Semitic, Christianity must die. This is supposedly a Christian minister. Here's another one. Christian anti-Semitism Sunday school analyzed. They are now going to analyze all of the Sunday school preaching in America in the Christian schools to be sure that the young children aren't taught anti-Semitism. Have any of you ever wondered why you never, ever, ever see a newspaper article that attempts to analyze the teachings of the Jews? No, it's always the Christians being analyzed, and they're wrong, and their teaching is wrong, and they must change their teaching, and so on. No one ever writes an article about what the Jews teach about the Christians. It's always the other way around. And then another article, Lutheran Jewish Talks Encouraged. So as you read all of these things, you recognize it's all the same idea. Number one, the Jews are those people who came out of Egypt, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Number two, Christianity is anti-Semitic, and therefore Christianity must be changed. And the whole upshot of the thing is a promotion of the idea that we Christian people, must now turn around and bring in Jews to teach us what we should know about the Bible, about religion, about Christianity, and so on, and so on, and so on. And these, of course, are just a handful or a few of the papers which arrive across my desk, and I know these are being published all over the country. Christianity is under a tremendous onslaught by the forces of evil to change Christianity into something which it was never intended to change. And they are now devising, of course, a method which we do not see here in the book of Acts, which I think actually is more subtle. They are going to leave us with Jesus Christ, but they are going to change all of his words. As you read those articles, there's sentence after sentence after sentence in there about Jesus Christ being a Jewish rabbi. Jesus Christ being a Jewish rabbi. So really, our Savior is a Jewish rabbi. I have four books in my hand, which I'll just show you. These are being sold in all the Christian bookstores across the nation. The Living Prophecies, the Living Books of Moses, the Living Letters, and the Living Gospels. In other words, the entire Bible has now been retranslated into what they call the Living Books. And the front page of this, these are promoted in recommended by Billy Graham as the tremendous books that we should now read. What they have done, they have translated this into America's language more or less today, and then they have inserted the word Jew or Jewish in here in scores of places where it is not in the original text. So whenever you read about Christians, you read about Jewish Christians. Whenever you read about the law, you read about the Jewish law or the law of the Jews. And the people of Israel are always referred to as Jews. For instance, in uh, John 4, where Christ met the Samaritan woman, they have Jesus Christ say, But you Samaritans know so little about him, worshiping blindly, while we Jews, and if you look this up in the King James, John 4, verse 24, Christ does not call himself a Jew, but here they have him call himself a Jew. We Jews know all about him, for salvation comes to the world through the Jews. Another place in here, they refer to these people as the Jewish Christians. In the letter to James, and I'm mentioning this because this is what is happening out there in the other churches. In the letter to James, you know, in the King James translation, it says to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. 
in here it's addressed to Jewish Christians scattered everywhere. To Jewish Christians scattered everywhere. In relation to the law. And this fits in with our preaching of repentance to Israel. We cannot convince Israel of their need to repent unless they understand the laws they have broken. So, the main teaching in the churches today is that the laws have been put away. Now listen to this new translation. And by the way, this has already been put in hardbound copies. And I believe may become the standard Bible in most denominational churches in a matter of a few years. But in Ephesians, you can read this in the King James Version, or if you have it there. In the second chapter of Ephesians, in verse 14, 15, and 16, For Christ himself is our way of peace. He has made peace between us Jews and you Gentiles by making us all one family, breaking down the wall of contempt that used to separate us. And as you read the newspaper, you'll recognize that according to a newspaper article, it's the contempt of Christians for the Jews which has to be broken down. Not, not contempt of Jews for Christians, contempt of Christians for Jews. All right, verse 15. By his death, he ended the anger and resentment between us caused by the Jewish laws which favored the Jews and excluded the Gentiles, for he died to annul that whole system of Jewish laws. He died to annul that whole system of Jewish laws. Now this may become the Bible. It's recommended by all of the major denominations. It's recommended by Billy Graham. It's being promoted as the Bible to the extent that these have been sold by the millions. They've now put it in hardbound copies, the whole Bible in one. Then he took the two groups that had been opposed to each other and made them parts of himself. Did you know that the Jews and the Gentiles are parts of Christ? That's what it says. He made them parts of himself. Thus he fused us together to become one new person, and at last there was peace. Oh yes, if we can get all the Christians and all the Jews to join together, we'll have peace. As parts of the same body, our anger against each other has disappeared, for both of us have been reconciled to God, and so the feud ended at last at the cross. What feud are we talking about? Well, we're talking about that feud that has existed between Jews and Gentiles. And of course, they convince us we're all Gentiles, and the Jews are all God's chosen people, and the newspapers, in conjunction with that kind of translation of the Bible, will turn and convince multiplied millions of foolish Christians that the thing we have to do is to join with the Jews. And those newspaper articles tell of several instances of large Lutheran and Catholic churches hiring Jewish rabbis on their staffs to teach the young people the Bible. You think there's anything Christian about the denominational churches anymore? Brother, sister, it is rapidly disappearing. All right, let's reread this verse 31 again. Acts 5. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. How in the world can we convince our people they must repent of the breaking of God's laws when they're continually told that the thing we must repent of is our attitude toward the Jews? No, brother, sister. It's our attitude toward God's Bible, his laws, his word, and Jesus Christ, which we must repent of. Not our attitude toward some other people. It's our attitude toward the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. Now I want to make a comment about all of those newspaper articles and the preachers that you may not have thought of. According to the Bible, Paul and Peter and the rest of these men recognize were to preach repentance to Israel. And that's the thing they were doing back in those days. Now, if the Jews are the Israel people, why are the ministers trying to preach Christians should repent of their attitude toward the Jews? Instead, they should be preaching to these wicked, sinful Jews that they should repent and turn to God, right? Every minister in the country who believes and teaches that the Jews are Israel should preach sermon after sermon after sermon to the Jews to tell them to repent. 
But instead of that, what are they doing? Strangely enough, they're telling us we have to repent about our attitude towards the Jews. You see, there is absolutely nothing scriptural about their teaching that the Jews are Israel. Because if they are, they are the ones who must repent, not the Christian people who have already repented to God Almighty and been baptized in his name and so on. No, the whole thing doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense because, of course, it is of the devil, it is the great false deception that was to rise at the end of the age, and it is directed to confuse the people of Israel who are supposed to turn and repent to the Lord God Almighty. And this is why I and ministers like myself find ourselves standing literally alone in preaching repentance to Israel. Now I want to comment for a few minutes on the trip that we made because this in effect is what we ended up doing. In every place where I had an opportunity to speak, I spoke on this subject. The United States of America, our nation, our race, our identity as Israel. I spoke on the money question, of course, because I'd invited to do that on our trip to Washington, D.C. But over and over and over, I repeated the same thing. The judgments that are coming upon America are coming because we have not repented as God's Israel people. And that is the hardest thing to get across to these patriots and these anti-communists because they have not been taught the law. They don't know God's law. Therefore, they don't know wherein we have sinned and how do they know how to repent. Paul said, I would have not known sin except by the law. Paul understood he was a sinner by reading the law. And when I look at that, what the law said, I wasn't doing it. I was disobeying it. Therefore, I was a sinner. Therefore, I must repent. It's the preaching of the law that Israel needs, not the preaching that somehow or other we just haven't been nice to these Jews who live in America. No, America is tremendously being deceived. Well, anyway, I want to get, spend the, a few minutes telling you about the trip because I believe that it's an advantage both to uh, uh, some of the people who may have heard some of these words of the Bible for the first time and also to me as a pastor because it helped me understand what's going on in the minds and the hearts of some of these, what I would call, good people. Christian people, people who are fearful about the nation. Anyway, the first time I spoke after leaving here was in St. Louis on the 19th on Saturday, and this was to an organization that was primarily dealing with the Federal Reserve System. So the subject, as they had put it on the flyer which they distributed, was the Bible, the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C. And so I spoke for about 45 minutes. There were about 45 people there would come from the St. Louis area, some from Illinois. One man drove all the way up from uh, someplace in Arkansas because he'd read the book Billions for the Bankers and then also Dr. Walker's in my book, and he wanted to meet the man who'd written part of that book. But these people, by and large, are people who have been working four years in organizations trying to eliminate the Federal Reserve System, fight high taxes, and all of these things that have to do with American money and property. I won't tell the whole thing that happened. I spoke for about 45 minutes. I answered questions for a little over two hours afterwards, and I finally had to leave because they had, I was in a room in a library, and they, Saturday afternoon they closed us up at 4.30 or quarter to 5, and we had to leave. So we got out and got on our way towards Chicago. But I want to give this one instance, and I hope we can take a lesson from this. Uh, one lady asked a question at the question and answer period, and then before I could answer, the man who arranged the meeting spoke up and identified her as the chairman of the Constitution Party for that state. The chairwoman, as it were, the Constitution Party for that state. She appeared to be very knowledgeable about the money system and so on. And in my answers later, I had pointed out that most of these people who are fighting the enemies, are very ignorant of the Word of God. Very ignorant of the Word of God. Well, brother, sister, I was given an example of it. Because this same lady came up to me afterwards, along with other people, after the question and answer was over, and talked up front 
And then in my attempt to impress upon her, because knowing her position as chairman of the Constitution Party for one of the states, to impress upon her that it was our sins, in other words, Israel's repentance, I referred to Daniel 9. And I suggested to her, I said, you read all of Daniel 9. This is Daniel's prayer to God Almighty for forgiveness for Israel's sins. He was in the Babylonian captivity, and she was staring at me rather strangely by then. So I said, well, now, you know Daniel's story. You know who Daniel was. And she shook her head, no. Brother, sister, she did not know who Daniel was. Now, there are 26, I believe, Constitution parties in the United States. They're organized in 26 states, I believe, at the last count. She's the chairman of one of the groups. She's fighting the Federal Reserve. They're trying to organize everything. They name the name of Jesus Christ, by the way, in the Constitution as their God. And she didn't know who I was talking about when I was talking about Daniel. Now, brother or sister, you don't have to go to church very much, any place at all, especially as a child. And Daniel is one of the first men you hear something about in the Bible. You know, you'll hear the name or you'll hear about him being in Babylon or one of the children of Israel or the other ones going through the fire and, and all of these things. And she did not know. Well, I thought now there was the perfect example of what is wrong with America. America does not know the word of God. And they're trying to fight all these things. Well, anyway, we went on. I spoke to another group in Minneapolis the day before the conference. This was a similar group, except, of course, some few of them were people who had known me or worked with me back when I was fighting the communists so actively. And there were about 55 or 60 people there that evening. Again, I spoke for 45 minutes, and then the question and answer period went on until 11 o'clock that night, and we finally had to leave. Most of these people, for the first time in many years, are beginning to realize they have to learn the Word of God. Because the things that I preached and taught about, in spite of the fact that most of them attend church, were very strange to them. Very strange. Some of them have recently discovered the Israel identity. Now they are reading their Bible. They're learning the Bible for the first time. Even after they accept the idea of us being Israel, it still takes time and sometimes years for them to get a good grasp on what is the truth of what is happening in America. So we have the same thing evidenced again. People who are anxious to fight the enemy, to destroy the enemies of America, save the nation, and they don't know how to do it because they do not know the Word of God. And they don't know what we've done wrong. And they do not understand. And they're just beginning to understand, at least praise the Lord, the idea that Peter and these men were preaching, repentance to Israel. Israel must repent, as Daniel recognized so much in the ninth chapter of Daniel. 